Transformation Church, what's happening? And to our guests, how is everybody doing? I pray that you are having a, uh, an epic week, even though we are in the midst of utter uncertainty. I'm so glad that God is certain. In the midst of utter confusion, I'm glad that God is never confused. And in the midst of all of this, my prayer above all prayers is that you are taking advantage of this opportunity to engage Jesus at a more profound and deeper and better and more beautiful level. Oftentimes, disguised in adversity is beautiful opportunity. Uh, before I welcome our guests, I want to talk to Transformation Church, to the TC family. Uh, right before I came out to preach, there's a, a map of the entire world in my office, and there are pin drops. It hasn't been updated lately, but there are pin drops all over the United States, South America, Europe, parts of Africa, uh, Australia, Hawaii, all types of places around the world right now as we speak are going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed in power with faith, believing that his gospel does set the captives free, that his gospel does release us from sin and death and evil, that his gospel does promise a, a new heavens and a new earth, and where there's his presence, there is his power. I believe that as a church, we're gonna be stronger as a result of this. I believe that as a gospel community, a family of difference who have the same blood of Jesus, I believe that we're gonna be stronger, we're gonna be more rooted and grounded in Jesus because our circumstances do not determine our faith. Our faith in Jesus is what gets us through our circumstances, not merely to survive, but to thrive. And when I say thrive, I'm talking about thriving and relying on the Holy Spirit's power. I'm talking about thriving and seeing a need and filling that need. I'm talking about thriving and praying and soaking and saturating ourselves in Christ. The world may see adversity, but you and I see the unseen. We see opportunity because God is always right in the midst of it, and he's working all things to conform us to the image of Christ Jesus. So listen, on Saturday nights, begin to pray. Begin to prepare, get your children ready, get, get, get your family ready, get, get your friends ready, get up in the morning, eat breakfast, be prayed up, put on some clothes if you want to, and prepare to engage. God is moving powerfully, friends. Right now, we are reaching, oh, seven to eight times more people than we have ever reached. Now, wouldn't it be sad if in the midst of this adversity, we wasted it and didn't see the opportunity. To our guests, thank you so much for tuning in. We know your time is valuable and we want to maximize that time uh, because we believe that Jesus is great. And so thank you for tuning in. And for those of you who are spiritual seekers, uh, you're curious about Christ, you, you, you've seen the questions that we are addressing, God, why is there evil and suffering? Watch that from last week. And this week, we're going to talk about God. Why are Christians hypocrites? God, why are Christians hypocrites? And, and that is a profound and it is a beautiful question. And it's one of our culture's favorite things to say. But I've got a question, though, about that question. Do we apply the same standards to other world views that we apply to Christianity or following Jesus? Because I don't hear other worldviews being called hypocrites, and you and I know that people aren't living perfect, so, so why does there seem to be this punching bag for Christianity that, well, you guys are hypocrites? And I got another quick question. How do you know how a Christian is actually supposed to live if you don't spend time in the Bible? And if you do spend time in the Bible, instead of coming down on hypocrites, you pray for hypocrites because Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, be careful lest you stumble, carry one another's burdens. In the words of that old school song, we all gonna need somebody to lean on. And just like the old school song that says, so we play the fool sometimes, well guess what? 
We play the hypocrite sometimes, and I'm going to show some reasons why. As a matter of fact, one day, you may catch me like on a Monday. I'm tired and exhausted. I had some nasty coffee, and, and the coffee and the Holy Spirit ain't even hit a br brother yet, and, and I might be rude. I might cut you off in traffic. You can go, look at Pastor Derwin. He's a hypocrite. We don't want one moment to define somebody's life. Would you want that? And then another thing that I would ask about that question is this. The ethics and the beauty of the life that Jesus lived and the life that Jesus invites us into to live through the Holy Spirit's power is so beautiful and so engaging that when people don't see it, they go, yeah, something's off. So what I want to do in this message is, is I want to walk through why are Christians hypocrites? Why are Christians hypocrites? Hypocrites. Well, let's first discuss the word hypocrite. Come with me in a time machine. Young people, teenagers, I need you to lean in. Get, get close to that device. Lean in with a brother. Let me smell your breath. All right, you brush your teeth this morning. It smells good. All right, check this out. 2,000 years ago, in the Greco-Roman world in which Jews and Jesus was situated in, when there was a drama or play, so everybody loves Hamilton, I love musicals, it's epic, it's beautiful, it's profound. Well, in the ancient world, they had plays as well. And the actors would come out and they would be holding a stick with a mask on it. And the actor would be called a hypocrite because they're playing a role that is not true to who they are. They're playing a role. And so the word hypocrite in its original meaning was not something negative. It just simply meant an actor was playing a role. Now, what Jesus does and what the early church does and what begins to happen is people who say they're something, but then they're really not, are being a hypocrite. So as followers of Jesus, we want to make sure that we are actors in God's drama, in God's story. God doesn't have a play called Hamilton. God has a play called the kingdom of God. And by grace, he invites us into the kingdom. And what's beautiful is he takes off our old mask, or as Romans chapter 6, verse 6 says, he takes off the old self and he gives us the new self. That is New Testament language for this. We are regenerated. We have the very life of God in us. We are restored to our humanity on the inside and God begins to live that out through us as we trust him by faith. But then that's the problem, trusting him by faith. So, so why are Christians such hypocrites? Number one, teenagers and preteens, holiness is a lifelong journey of trusting Jesus. Holiness is a lifelong journey of trusting Jesus. Let, let me define our terms so we don't have some unmet expectations. The, the word holiness in the Hebrew as well as the Greek, the Old Testament and New Testament means this, to be set apart. So first and foremost, when we sing songs that God is holy, what we're saying is he's different than us. He is moral perfection. He is beauty in all of its totality. He is pure. He is glorious. He is beyond any human category. So all we can say is holy. He is other. He is separate. Well, the God who is Holy desires to be in a relationship with us. And when we were first created through Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were holy, but when they chose to rebel against God, understand this, sin is not simply I did a little boo-boo. Sin is this, God, I am renouncing my right to rule and reign with you. I am renouncing the holiness that you gave me. And ever since that moment, every single human being, all of us, even our good intentions are saturated with, this is for my kingdom, this is for my glory, not for your glory. And you're going, well, why does God need glory? God has to have glory because glory is intrinsic to who he is. He is other. God doesn't need glory. God is glory, and we need his glory because that which we admire, we become like, and God is so beautiful. He says, when you gaze upon me, I'll begin to rub off on you. So what happens is this, is when Jesus comes, he is the embodiment of holiness. Holiness is pure, 
perfection and love. And Jesus comes to live a holy life for us because I couldn't and you couldn't. Let me talk to the person right now who's gonna go, Derwin, I'm not that bad. Well, understand this, every human being is born spiritually dead. God did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And the very fact that we boast about our goodness is an indication that we don't know God's greatness. Because when we know God's greatness, all we can do is fall down to a knee and go, if not by the grace of God, there go I. Grace humbles us without deflating us, and it encourages us without elevating us. Grace puts us in Christ, and our eyes are set to him. So by faith in Jesus, we come to the point and we say, God, I I am a sinner. I have broken all of your commands. I'm born spiritually dead. And this is a supernatural act that takes place. And we respond to what God is doing. And we say yes to Jesus. We're blood bought. We're blood purchased. His blood cleanses us of all sin. His blood brings us into God's family through the resurrection power. And all of a sudden, we are now set apart. In other words, God grabs us out of darkness, as the scripture says, and brings us into the kingdom of his son, the kingdom of light. So by position, we are holy. What does that mean? It means this, that the holiness that Jesus has now is attributed to you and attributed to me based on what Jesus has done. In other words, Jesus stands in our place. Jesus does this great exchange, and what's true of him is true of us. So holiness is a gift, but also, here comes a theological word, holiness is called progressive sanctification. Sanctification and holiness means the same thing. So what we are by position, when we learn to trust Jesus day by day, we begin to practice, and you guys know Y'all know this if you've been around Transformation Church for a while. If you're new, we love the philosopher Allen Iverson. At a news conference years ago, he said, I'm talking about practice, man. I'm talking about practice. So what we are by position in Christ, holy, as we trust Jesus, what we are by position, we become by practice. And so what happens is, is we begin to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. That's called justice. The word justice simply means this. If something's wrong, I want to make it right, not just individually, but also systemically. We begin to, to share our faith. We become missionaries. We, we see all of life as worship, and, and we see ourselves as missionaries, and we see people as people to be loved and a hope and a desire for them to come to experience Jesus. We display humility and and kindness. So, so holiness is a lifelong journey. But here's the problem, though. A journey necessitates that the same faith that brought you into the kingdom is the same faith that grows you in the kingdom. By the way, today is my 23rd spiritual birthday in Jesus Christ. 23 years ago at Anderson University in Anderson, Indiana, my fifth year in the NFL, training camp with the Colts. On August 1st, we played a preseason game against the Cincinnati Bengals. I stubbed my big toe trying to tackle a big running back by the name of Corey Dillon. Uh, I couldn't practice. After lunchtime, I was walking back to my dorm, and there was just this huge void in my soul. And as I got back to my dorm room, I called my precious wife, and I said, I want to be more committed to you, and I want to be committed to Jesus. And right there in that moment, I felt the God of love. At that moment, I knew when I was born again, when God moved me and set me apart as one of his child, I became one of Abba's child. Abba is the Aramaic name for Father God, that he's our Abba, that he's our Papa God. I became one of his children 23 years ago today, and if somebody would have told me 23 years later all this would have happened, I would have said, only God can do that. I want you to have only God can do that moment, but it starts with the forgiveness of sins. It starts with embracing who Jesus has called us to be. But that first year was tough, man. It was hard. 
For 26 years of my life, I was used to satisfying the flesh. What does that mean? It means this, that we learn how to survive in life by doing things that we think will satisfy us. That's called the flesh. Well, when we come to Jesus, the Spirit of God comes inside of us, and there's this battle between our new nature and our fleshly desires, because it was easy to lie, it was easy to cheat, but then you get the Holy Spirit, and you're like, oh, I can't do that anymore, and it's like this battle. And I remember on, uh, uh, at the kitchen reading the Bible, and I was crying, going, God, help me, this is so hard. So, so you know what, there were moments that first year that definitely I was a hypocrite because I chose, Jesus, um, I'm gonna take a time out and not walk in the spirit. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you did that with an argument with your husband. Maybe you did that with an argument with your wife. Maybe you're doing that in your parenting. Maybe you're doing that now. You're going, God, where are you in COVID-19? Where are you? And God is going, I'm in the same place I was when my son died on the cross to forgive your sin. I'm on the same place I was when I said, seek first the kingdom of God and my righteousness and I will provide all things to you. He's in the same place. He hasn't moved. Let's make sure that we don't move. So watch this. Why are we hypocrites? Because the struggle is real. This is what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. So the trouble is not with the law, upward, inward, outward. That's good. Love God, love yourself, love your neighbor. That's a good thing. So the trouble's not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble's with me, for I am all too human a slave to sin. Paul is going, you know, the old way I used to live, it still calls me. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. That's why you have people who follow Jesus end up having hypocritical moments, because there's a struggle, and they go, okay, okay, God, 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 no, 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 no. I'm gonna get my need met this way instead of trusting you. I want immediate gratification even though I know it's not gonna last. So, so what do we do? What, what hope is there for us not to have hypocrites? Paul answers us and I love what he does. It's so deep, it's so theological, it's a battle cry, it's a cry of need, it's a cry of grace. Look what he says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free, th- who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Paul is going, who will free me, who will free me? me. In verse 25, he goes, thank God, thank Yahweh. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord, Jesus Christ, our King. In other words, Paul is saying this, when you and I are in the midst, in the midst of the battle, don't go, I'm going to fight the battle. You fall to your knees and you cry out and you say, God, help me. Jesus, help me. Help me. Live through me. Help me. Cry out to him. We need some people crying out to God. We need some people like the children of Israel when they were in slavery. Exodus 3, 2 says, and they cried out to God and God heard their cries. Question, with the sin that you're battling with, Is it a friend or an enemy? Because God will only release you from enemies, not your friends. Cry out to him. How do I know it works? Because he's still working in me. I'm not who I used to be, I'm not who I'm gonna be, because precious Jesus and his grace is still building me, and he wants to do that to you. But you need to have one of these deep prayers. Lord Jesus, thank you. Live in me, live through me. I cry out to you. So a lot of Christians get stuck. What they are by position in Christ, they fail to realize by practice in Christ because they stop believing. There are some doors that they leave unaccessible to the Holy Spirit. Teenagers, why are some Christians hypocrites? Because holiness is a choice to put on Christ. Holiness is a choice to put on Christ. So you know what we need? We need help. Lean on me. We all need somebody to lean on. I I mean, that's a great theological song because we all need somebody to lean on. We need need community. One of my teammates named Ray McElroy, I preached about him last week, introduced me to a guy who worked for the city of Indianapolis. He still does to this very day. His name is Alan Bacon. And I had hurt my leg against the New England Patriots, which, by the way, in God's sovereignty, in his providence, and how he orchestrates the universe, my injuries I thought were actually hurting me, but my injuries through football were actually healing me. Uh Uh-oh. 
Am I, am, I, am I doing like some Jedi mind tricks? No, I'm doing some gospel. You see, because my football career was so dominant, God used those injuries to wean me off of them like a baby off of a pacifier so that I could feed from his pure milk of the word. Maybe God is doing that to you in COVID. So don't go back, don't give up, stay focused on Jesus. Don't look at the conflict, don't look at the chaos, don't look at the confusion, look at the cross, look at the empty tomb, look to Jesus. Set your mind on things above. We're a Blessed Hope Baptist Church, Missionary Baptist Church, Black Baptist Church. It's a little old bitty thing in the, in the hood. My knee was messed up and Vicky and I were there and some other uh, uh, Indianapolis Colts prayer, players and, Anthony, and, and, and Alan Bacon was, was just preaching through Acts chapter five and I was like, man, I wanna know the Bible like that. And then as a football player, I was always taught, and this is so important, some of y'all gotta be hungry, man. You gotta secure the bag. Like when you see something you want, you go learn from that person. Learn, like I'm not preaching just to preach, y'all. Like you can listen to these messages over and over and over again. I have a lot of mentors who are in heaven. I read their books. I have a lot of mentors from around the world. I read their books. But we have the greatest book, this book. We're gonna talk about it in a moment. Let, let me show you a picture of Alan. So this is Alan. Um, Alan is in his 60s, and I know it's hard to believe black don't crack. He's like not aged. And, and so I was able to present him with my brand new book, The Good Life. And he knew me long ago. And he always saw something in me. And so Alan mentored me, but it wasn't like a program. It, it wasn't systematic. It, it, was, it was in life and during life. And it was his example. It was caught as well as taught. But the one thing was, man, Derwin, you gotta be in the word. Uh, recent research said that 32% of Christians are in the Word every day, and I suppose that that also means listening audibly. So listen, I don't care if you read it, I don't care if you listen audibly, but cry out to Jesus, come to know him and his kingdom. I think right now what's happening in this midst of COVID, COVID is we're seeing that a lot of theology that was taught is crumbling to the ground because Jesus wasn't to be worshiped. Jesus was to be used. I wasn't following Jesus to be savior for my sin. I was following Jesus because he's a divine butler, that everything's gonna be a blessing, that everything's gonna work out okay, and now it's not working out okay, and people are going, oh, forget that. I praise God. We've never taught that here, that Jesus is not a means to an end. Jesus is the end. Jesus is not a resource. Jesus is the source. If all Jesus does is bleed on us and raise from the dead, he has done enough. We worship Jesus for Jesus himself, but you need community. You need people pouring into you. Our Zoom groups are growing. People are connecting, but you got to get in the word. You go, Dorn, I don't know what to do. Listen, send us an email. We've got resources. We will help you. Like, Dorn, I don't understand the Bible. We will help you get Bibles with commentaries. Eat this Book. One of the things that in COVID, Netflix has gone up, all types of stuff has gone up. We need this to go up. We need this to go up. Spend time starting the Gospel of John. Get a, I mean, there's all types of Bible apps. We want to help you. You need community. We, we put on Jesus through, through prayer. And sometimes the greatest prayer you can pray is this, Lord, your will be done. If you don't know what to pray, just say, Lord, your will be done. If you don't know what to pray, say, Holy Spirit, pray for me. If you don't know what to pray, just say, just say, Lord, be great in me today. Teach me to love today. Provide for my daily needs today. We need each, each other. Small groups, getting the word. This is how it's a choice to put on Christ. Here's a question. In the midst of COVID, and, and, and yes, we're getting COVID fatigue in the midst of the economy tanking. Um, my mom has COVID, my 21-month-old nephew has COVID, and thank you guys for praying. They're, they're doing really well. Keep on praying. We're, we're fatigued, we're, we're tired, but here's my, my, my thing. You, you ready? So I want you to hear, hear, hear my heart. I'm gonna put on pastor football hat, okay? We're fatigued and tired, but what that gotta do with 
keeping your eye on Jesus. This is the time to draw near to him, not draw away from him, draw near to him. Put on Christ. Our circumstances are not our God. We're more than conquerors in him who loved us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So here's the deal. Here at Transformation Church, upward, inward, outward, love God, love self, love neighbor, does not change because of COVID, does not change because of elections, does not change because of anything, because our God, you ready, comes a big word, is immutable. That means he's unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is faithful. He is faithful. You may not understand his faithfulness. You may not understand what he's doing, but he's a good God and you can trust him. I didn't understand when I was hurting my knee. I didn't understand when football was being ripped away from me. Sometimes God rips away from us so he can give us something. Open your hands and trust him. The hands that were nailed to a cross are good hands. They're faithful hands. We need Alan Bacons in our lives. That happens in community. Our Zoom groups get plugged in. Romans 13, 14. Let us walk with decency. So let me put it this way. Let us respond on Facebook with decency. Hey, if you're a Christian, and let me say this with love, okay? You can get mad at me if you want to. That's, that's fine. But please, when I go to your Facebook page, can I see stuff about Jesus and not uh, politics and crazy conspiracies, please? Because what's gonna help people is Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God. Please never forget, get, 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 get this. Jesus' church started 2,000 years ago, and it's been around and it's gonna be around. The gates of hell will never prevail against Jesus' kingdom, so our allegiance is to Jesus' kingdom first and foremost, so get people into the kingdom, not into a political party. Get people into the kingdom, not into a political party. Are politics important? Yes. Do I vote? Yes. People go, Durham, why do you vote? Because voting matters. And also, my people were lynched. My people had dogs sicked on them. My people couldn't even vote. So I'm going to exercise my right to vote. But my greatest vote was cast on August 2nd, 1997, not to make Jesus his Lord, because he is Lord and King and ruler and redeemer and the great I am, regardless of what I do, he is who he is. But we need to tap into who he is so who he is can be expressed through us on earth. Let us walk with decency, friends, as in the daytime. Uh, that means that God is looking, not in carousing, one of those words, carousing and drunkenness. So remember, a lot of the Gentiles had come out of a, uh, um, um, a non-Jewish life and drinking and, and carousing with uh, sex with anybody. And he goes, you know, so, so notice the uh, trajectory of carousing, drunkenness, you lose inhibition, not in sexual impurity and promiscuity. Um, in other words, don't be wilding out. You, your, your, your bodies are important. Let me pause here. Let me pause here. Uh, let me come, let me, come, on, come over here. Let me come over here. Did you know since COVID, pornography viewing has skyrocketed? Pornography is sin, that's sexual immorality. Now, I don't want you to hear condemnation, I want you to hear conviction and invitation to come to Jesus. Um, you are searing your consciousness. You, you, are, you are belittling this beautiful gift that God has given us. And I know for some of you going, well, well, you know, I'm not having sex with my wife. Or, or da, da, da. L -l Listen, Jesus is sufficient. No one ever said it was gonna be easy. Narrow is the path that leads to eternal life. Narrow is the path, and some of you are gonna mess around and get addicted, and what happens when you get addiction is it messes up any type of normal and beautiful sex life that you can have with your husband or your wife eventually. God is not trying to keep fun from you. God is actually trying to show you what fun actually is. Not only has pornography increased, but alcohol consumption has increased. Now, li listen, if you're over 21, the Bible says don't get drunk with wine. Don't, don't get drunk, right? But some of us, because we can't cope with reality, are taking more prescription pills or are, are, are drinking more. One glass of wine turns into four glasses of wine. 
Press into Jesus, family. Put on Christ. Nothing can satisfy you like him. Come to God and repent. Lord, I've been watching this trash. And, and this is not just a men's issue. This is a woman's issue. Listen, being a woman in the world, and particularly the United States of America, tells you your body is what matters. And we got social media apps that you can get famous for just dancing half naked. You're worth more than that. You're worth so much more, but you won't know how much you're worth until you see the cross and the bloodied, brown-skinned at Jesus who hung there bleeding for you. When you see Jesus, that's when you know you are worthy because he wouldn't just die for junk. And loving yourself correctly means if God died for me, I love myself and I want to walk in decency. I want to put on Christ. Listen, an addict never suffers alone. Whether if it's prescription pills, whether if it's meth, whether if it's crack, whether if it's your bottles of wine, whatever it is, an addict never suffers alone. What an addict does is it pulls their family members into their whirlpool of dysfunction and it is painful and it is destructive. Put on Christ, put on Christ. But watch what he does here, what, what the Apostle Paul does here. Not in quarreling and jealousy. N notice how Paul puts these two sins, arguing and jealousy, with here. You know, they say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie. That's a lie. Words do hurt. And so it's really important for us to put on Jesus but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desire. You go, Derwin, well, how do you put on Jesus? You remember who you are in Christ. You have your brothers and sisters pray for you. You spend time in a word. You cry out to God. You put your face on the floor and you pray and you fast and you say, Jesus, live through me. You say, Jesus, may nothing satisfy me like you. You pray over yourself. You preach over yourself. Why are Christians such hypocrites? Because holiness is a war. Let the Holy Spirit fight for you. Holiness is a war. Let the Holy Spirit fight for you. Uh, when I was a little boy, um, there was this particular house in elementary school uh, that I had to run past. It was some older gang dudes there, and uh, they would call us the N-word. Can you imagine that? Things that I used to think were normal are so dysfunctional. For an elementary school kid to have to walk past uh, a gang house, get called the N-word, back and forth, and yeah, that's, just, that's what you did. But one of the things is when we got past that house, boy, we opened it up. We took off running. But the closer I got to home, the slower I ran and the happier I got. You know why? Because my cousin Squinky was there. Now, Squinky's real name was JV, uh, but as you know, people in the hood do not go by their real names. Like, I went by Dewey. Dewey is nowhere on my birth certificate. My name is Derwin Lamont Gray, but everybody called me Dewey. So when I go back to San Antonio, it's Dewey, not Derwin. It's Dewey. They don't know who Derwin is. They only know who Dewey is. But nevertheless, the closer I got home, I knew Squinky was there. And you know what? Squinky was crazy. He threw them hands with the best of them. It didn't matter. So I knew when I got close to home, I could slow down and stick my chest up because I had somebody who would fight for me. Well, guess what? When sin comes to your door, when sin is chasing after you, you can stop and turn around. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit will fight for you. He is undefeated. He is not intimidated. Call on him. How do we know? Watch this. I say then walk by the Spirit and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. In other words, what you want to do, you cannot do in your own power. You and I can't love God love ourselves and love our neighbors. That means not to practice sin. We can't do that. But the Holy Spirit 
will do it for us and in us and through it. But we've got to intentionally walk by the Spirit. Family, li- listen to me. And those of you who are not yet followers of Christ, listen to me now. This is, this is important. This is what you and I do. We go, okay, I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to watch porn. I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I, I, I. And like I've been saying for 10 years, it's not called Iaanity. It's called Christianity because it's Christ. We put on Christ. And the way we put on Christ is by walking in the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? We set our minds on things above. What do you do and I do when we say a sign that says, wet paint, don't touch? It's like, wet paint, don't touch. Oh, wow, it is wet. Well, it's the same thing when we go, I'm not gonna watch porn. I'm not gonna do this. I'm not gonna do this. I'm not gonna do sexual immorality. I'm not gonna be greedy. Oh, I did it again. Don't do that. Just do this. Oh, God, you're so gracious. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Matter of fact, right where you are, do this right now and watch what happens. Just say this in your mind. God, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the bloody cross. Thank you for the blood bath. Thank you that I'm forgiven. Thank you that I'm chosen. Thank you that I'm loved. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for you. What just happened? You just went into a praise party. That's why we say all of life is worship. The way you and I fight the war is through praise, there is a battle cry in your song. I don't care if you sing good or sing bad, just call out his name. Those who call upon the Lord will be rescued. Call his name, husband. Call his name, wife. Call his name, teenager. Call out to him. Watch him show up. Watch his power on display. Watch his love grab a hold of you. Nothing, and I mean nothing, can separate you from the love of Christ. Jesus is undefeated. Death couldn't hold him. Sin couldn't stop him. He is seated at the right hand. The Spirit has come. He is your strength. He fights your battle. Will you call out to him? Call his name. Call him in your home. Call him in your marriage. Call him in your relationship. Call Call him in your finances. Call his name. There is no name greater than his name. His name is above all names that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Would you call to him? If you're new, you're going, man, you take this seriously. Yes, I do. Why wouldn't you? We ain't got time to play games. The world is burning around us. And God has left us on earth to burn with his holiness so that the world in darkness could see him. You see, your healing is key to the world healing. Why are Christians hypocrites? This is the one I wanted to get to. Not all who say they follow Jesus are his followers. It's simple. There is no doubt throughout history. Read the book of Acts. There are people who will co-opt Christianity for political power, financial power, all types of misuse and abuse. I I mean, sadly, there, there are some people who become priests or pastors to be pedophiles. There, there, are, there are people who, who preach a false gospel to, to get wealthy. There are people who will even use it for political expediency. So not everybody who says they follow Jesus are actually on team Jesus. How do you tell a counterfeit bill from a real bill? You study the real bill so well that you can see a fake. The way we study the real bill so well is through the scripture. Let me make this simple. When you're learning about Jesus, the focus is always him. If it's not, that's a problem. The Holy Spirit exists to make much of Jesus. God the Father sent Jesus. Jesus is the object of our faith, and the Father and Holy Spirit are never in competition with Jesus because they share the same being. Check this out. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates 
his brother or sister, he's a liar. Now, let me pause here because there's some people go, well, I, I don't hate anybody else. Well, our definition of hate is too low. Do you look down upon another human being made in the image of God? Do you feel like you're better than other people made in the image of God? And let me say this. This is so important, y'all. Hear my heart on this, okay? Being poor and in the hood is not sin. Um, you do know that white-collar crimes and corporate crimes are not punished the same way poor people's crimes are punished. You do know that, right? Some of the biggest heists, some of the biggest forgeries that happen in this country are not by poor people. So, so let's be careful. Like, we really need to go to the ghetto. Friends, you know where the most drug use is in public schools in Charlotte area? It ain't the hood schools, it's the suburban schools. But the thing about the hood and the suburbs is mommy and daddy in the suburbs may be a lawyer or got friends who are lawyers who can get their kids out of stuff and years down the road it still affects them. So, so, so let's be mindful of that. To be poor doesn't mean that you're sinful. And to be middle class or wealthy doesn't mean that you got it together because I counsel a lot of wealthy and middle class people and poor people. And here's one thing we all got in common. We jacked up, toe up from the flow up, and we all need grace. Like we've said around here for 10 years, the only time we should ever look down on somebody is when we are lifting a hand down to lift them up. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. I, I mean, that's pretty simple. So if you wanna know if someone truly follows Jesus, they're gonna love human beings. Now, once again, to love you doesn't mean I gotta agree with you or the choices you make. It just means I affirm the image of God in you and I'm gonna respect you. Jesus goes off in Matthew 23. It is epic. Listen to this. Woe to you. Now, understand this. When Jesus says, woe, he's not going, woe. He's not, that's, woe. No, he's not doing the woe dance. No, no. He's going, woe, as in you are unraveling before the holiness of God and judgment is coming. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites, you pay a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin. So in other words, they gave 10% of their herbs, right? So they, they tithe their little 10%, yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law. And the law is love God, love self, love neighbor. Justice, you've neglected justice. Hey, friends, have we neglected justice? Do we go, well, that's not my problem because it doesn't affect me. I'm sure glad Jesus didn't, didn't say, hey, Dad, I'm not going to earth because sin doesn't affect me. That's not my problem. Mercy. What about mercy? Oh, man, what about mercy? Aren't you glad Jesus was merciful to you? Maybe you're not merciful because you haven't experienced Jesus' mercy and faithfulness. These Things should have been done without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but gulp down a camel. Ooh, Jesus is going off with first century Hebraic expressions. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. These were the lawyers, these were the scholars. The Pharisees were like a ground roots movement of about 7,000 Jewish men and they felt like we've gotta get Israel to live the law, the 10 commandments, and so they added uh, like 603 more laws. Hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but the inside are full of greed and self-indulgence. One of the ways is greed. Now people go, well, Durbin, I'm not greedy. Okay, if you wanna know if you're greedy, look at your checkbook because our money tells us where our heart and our priorities are. Blind Pharisees, hold on, hold on, wait, 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 I felt something there, hold on. But inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. If that's you, there's a merciful God who says, come to me, child, and repent. What you're holding on to, what you're indulging yourself in, isn't as good as my grace. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside of it may also be clean. They were good at external religion, but jacked up on the inside. 
Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of bones of the dead and every kind of impurity. Oh, my goodness. On the outside, man, great religion. They go every Sunday morning, but on the inside, verse 28, in the same way, on the outside, you seem righteous to people, but on the inside are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Finally, teenagers, listen to this. Gen Z, listen to this. Christians are known by how they love. Once again, love doesn't mean I approve your sin. Love means I approve your human dignity and worth. It's the kindness of the Lord that brings people to repentance. He says this, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Why are Christians such hypocrites? Here's the main thing to take away. As we trust Jesus and grow in holiness, we can have an opportunity to display Jesus to the world. And when we stumble and when we fall, we say to Jesus, I'm sorry, and we say to those we've hurt, I'm sorry. Humility and kindness wrapped in love is a portrait and picture of what it means to grow as a follower of Jesus. Tina Turner, the great philosopher of early rock and roll, said this, in the 80s, she had a song that says, what does love got to do with it? Is it just a secondhand emotion? And I say, no, love has to do with it all because we've been brought into being by loved, rescued by loved, so that we can love. Let me talk to those of you who are exploring who Jesus is, Maybe you're someone who on the outside, you've been very religious and very clean. Maybe you're a teenager. I don't know who you are, but something has happened where you go, the Jesus you just described, I don't follow him, but today I do. So listen, Jesus is inviting you to come to know him. Jesus is inviting you to experience his forgiveness. Jesus is inviting you to put him on so the Holy Spirit's power can be in you. You can be a part of his family, but you can also be a part of transforming human destiny. God is calling you. Maybe you're one of those people where you go, oh my gosh, I am the scribe and the Pharisee. God, I need to repent. Maybe you're the person going, Pastor, I don't even know what you're saying. I'm, I'm just ready to have my sin forgiven and follow Jesus. Friends, today is your day. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Right now, if you're ready to follow Jesus, you're ready to surrender your life to him, you're ready to repent of your sins, you're ready to believe, you're ready for his blood to give you a new life and his resurrection to give you a new power, you're ready to follow him as king and as Lord. Today is your day. Today is your day. This is your moment. 23 years ago today was the day I made the best decision I ever did. The best decision I ever made was to follow Jesus. Today, are you ready to make that decision? That's you in the silence of right where you are. Say this, today, Lord Jesus, I'm ready to make the best decision of my life, and it's my decision to follow you. Today, by faith, I believe that on that bloody, rugged cross, you took my place. You bled, you died, your blood forgives me, it cleanses me, it purifies me, it makes me righteous. And on the third day, you rose again to now live your life in me through the power of the Holy Spirit. You invite me into your kingdom, and I'm invited into your power. I am made new, I am holy by position, and now I'm ready to be holy by practice. I trust you all the days of my life, Lord Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. What I want you to do right now on the lower third of the screen, you have our connection card. If you prayed with me, I want you to check, I prayed to receive Christ, or I renewed my faith in Christ. 
That is really important to us. I want you to take time to do that. Here's what's gonna happen next. We're gonna get in contact with you to begin to resource you and to begin to help you grow in this newfound, beautiful life. So please, whether if you're a teenager or a preteen, whoever you are, take time to do that. All right, family, here is our soul tattoo. Our soul tattoo is this, commit to helping someone else grow in their faith. Uh, you can get in a Zoom group, over social media, relationships. Uh, commit to helping someone grow in their faith. You got to where you are because there are people who believed and mentored you. I am where I am because of people like Alan Bacon. Imagine who the people will be that you pour into and you go, well, Derwin, I don't have much to give. Let me say this. Child, please. Yes, you do. You know who you have to give? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have all that you need because Jesus is all that you need. I love you guys, and we'll catch you next week.